Good evening, everybody. This is a Quick Notes Corporation Accounting in a basic accounting approach. So, if you are a higher accounting student, maybe this will help you review some concepts, but uh, we will not be discussing some more deeper topics like uh, share warrants or share options because this is for basic accounting students. And also, uh, this lesson is intended only for students who went through a thorough discussion of corporation accounting and will only serve as final coaching theory explanations. So this will not be an in-depth discussion of corporation accounting. We will just be dealing with uh, some quick review of the theories and uh, concepts that we need to understand in corporation accounting. Okay, so before anything else, may I please again request you guys to please like and subscribe my channel. This is Roshua's Accounting Lessons PH. Welcome to my channel and good day everybody. Okay, so let's start with this Quick Notes Corporation Accounting. Okay, so let's review the concepts of total shareholders equity. So the components of total shareholders equity, the first component would be contributed capital, which includes legal capital and additional paid-in capital. Always remember that the items that we report in legal capital are the items that are reported at par value, which includes preference share capital, which is the number of issued shares multiplied by the par value of preference shares, and then ordinary share capital, which is the number of issued ordinary shares multiplied by the ordinary shares par value, and then the number of shares subscribed multiplied by their respective par values, those are preference share subscribe and ordinary share subscribe. So basically, the items that we report in legal capital is reported at par value. Okay, and then we also have additional paid in capital. In additional paid in capital, capital sorry, we have premiums. So um, preference share premium and then ordinary share premium and all other paid in capital from various transactions. Actually, we have so many kinds of additional paid in capital, but uh, this will not be thoroughly discussed in this video. Okay, so the next part of shareholders' equity is retained earnings. So we have appropriated retained earnings or retained earnings that are set aside for a specific purpose, while unappropriated retained earnings are those retained earnings that we can distribute uh, as dividends. And then the last part, actually this is not considered a part of total equity, but we need to further highlight it, which is, or which are contra equity accounts, which are treasury shares, which are reported at cost, and then the non-current subscription receivable. So always remember when subscription receivable is uh, current or uh, collectible within one year, then we shall report that as a current asset. However, when your subscription receivable is non-current, then it will become a contra equity account. Okay, so we add contributed capital, retain earnings, and then deduct all contra equity accounts, and that will be reported as your total shareholders equity. Okay, so let's start. In uh, issuance of shares, we have the following entry, debit cash or other non-cash asset or expense. So basically, when you, we are issuing shares, it's either we issue them for cash or maybe we purchase some sort of equipment, land or furniture, okay? And uh, also, we paid for expenses like legal fees and then credit share capital and credit share premium. So... When we debit cash, always remember to multiply the number of issued shares to the issue price. Okay, In the Philippines, the issue price may be equal to par or higher than par, but it's not allowed in the Philippines that we issue shares lower than the par value. Okay, And then in other non-cash asset, we always record the acquisition cost of the asset. Or the fair value of the asset but if those uh, amounts will not be available or proven not available then the non-cash asset will be measured at the fair value of the shares 
However, when the fair value of the shares are not also available, then our last option would be the par value of the shares. And same with expenses. Okay, the expenses that we paid for will be debited or in the absence of that amount, then we can use the fair value of those shares. And lastly, the par value of the shares. And then we credit share capital in which we multiply the number of shares that we have issued multiplied by the par value. Any excess between the cash, the, uh, the cost of the asset that we purchased, uh, or the expense that we paid it will be equal to premium. So any excess will be credited to premium. Okay, then we also have some sort of subscription. Okay, so upon subscription, the entry would be debit share capital subscription receivable that is the number of shares that were subscribed multiplied by the subscription price. Okay, and then we credit it to shares subscribed. Shares subscribed is the number of shares issued multiplied by the par value. Always remember that subscribed shares are also reported at par value. The difference between the two will be reported as premium. Okay, so basically the subscription price for each share can be higher than the par value of the share. In case the entity is receiving payments from the subscription, then we debit cash from the payment that we have received or the company has received and then credit share capital subscription receivable. So we will be deducting it to the subscription receivable T account. And then upon full payment, so when we receive full payment from the subscribers, we will just be doing this entry again. This one, debit cash credit, share capital subscription receivable for the full payment and then recognize that these shares will already be given stock certificates. So debit share subscribe with a number of shares that has full payment and then credit share capital. So it will automatically be reported as share capital. Always remember that those shares who only has a uh, uh, full payment for the subscription will be issued stock certificates. So we have two options for the uh, uh, subscription defaults. It's either we issue them to the highest bidder. So when the highest bidder uh, pays for the balance of those shares, then the shares will be issued to the highest bidder. Or it can be issued to the name of the corporation. And when those shares are issued to the corporation, then it's treasury shares. Okay, let's continue with dividends. Okay, we have different types of dividends. Always remember that dividends are distribution of corporate earnings to outstanding shareholders. We're talking about outstanding, not the issued ones. Okay, so first is cash dividends, dividends in the form of cash. Dividends in the form of cash, but it's not yet uh, paid within that specified period, so it will earn interest. That is script dividends. And then we also have property dividends. Property dividends is it's either we give shares of a subsidiary that we have acquired or some sort of physical asset as dividends. And then we also have stock dividends and in which we give shares as a form of dividend. Now, always remember that when we give or provide shareholders stock dividends, there will be no change in the total shareholders' equity because it will just be um, reflected as a debit to retained earnings, but it will just be transferred to another equity account. Okay, So always remember that there is no change in total equity when we provide shareholders stock dividends. Stock dividends has two kinds. We have the large stock dividend or the large bonus issue and the small stock dividend or the small bonus issue. So basically what happens is that uh, we can judge it as a small bonus issue if it's 1 to 19% and 20% above is large bonus issue. Now, we debit retained earnings at the fair value of each share when we are talking about small bonus issue. But always remember that we only uh, record it at par or we debit retained earnings at par in cases of large bonus issue.
Okay. Now, cash dividends will be given to shareholders, but we need to understand that preference shares has different kinds. Okay. So in uh, in distributing cash dividends to shareholders, we need to take into consideration the kind of the preference shares. Preference shares may be cumulative, non-cumulative, participating, or non-participating. When preference shares are cumulative, the preference shares has the capacity to receive the previous years unpaid dividends so in any cases that there are unpaid dividends to preference shares they have the right to claim that okay when preference shares are non-cumulative so basically the opposite is true for non-cumulative when shares are non-cumulative sorry when preference shares are non-cumulative then they have no right to receive the previous years unpaid dividends and then in participating uh, there will be a participation between preference shares and ordinary shares. So basically what happens when preference shares are, are participating, um, ordinary shares assume the same dividend rate with that of preference shares. And then in case there are still balances after giving preference shares their uh, current dividends, uh, both PS and OS will participate in the balance. So the opposite is true with non-participating in which there will be no participation. And usually what happens in non-participating preference shares is that all of the balance of the dividends that were declared after giving the current dividends to preference shares, it will be given to ordinary shares. Okay, So in dividends per share, always remember whatever amount of cash dividends were given to both PS and OS, divide it to the number of outstanding shares both for PS and OS, then that would be the dividends per share. Okay, and then we also have a book value per share. We compute book value. Usually, we want to determine the value of each share in case of liquidation or corporate liquidation or corporate closure. So, so for book value per share, we start with the computation of total shareholders' equity, and then we deduct the equity that is identifiable with preference shares. For, so, for us, for us to understand what is the equity identified with preference shares, it just has two components. It's just have two components we have dividends so specifically those are current dividends for preference shares but in any case that preference shares are cumulative then we can also uh, provide in this computation the uh, unpaid dividends that were not given to them and also the like liquidation value of preference shares okay so you add those two that's your, that is your equity identified with preference shares so we deduct total equity to the eips and it will give you your equity identified with ordinary shares so basically it's just a residual approach this is total equity and then this is your equity identified with preference shares the balance will be the one identifiable with ordinary shares so it gives us this equation the equity identified with preference shares will be divided to the number of outstanding preference shares that is your book value per preference share and then equity identified with ordinary shares divided by the number of outstanding ordinary shares that is your book value per ordinary share we also go on with basic earnings per share. So we will not be discussing here diluted earnings per share since this is a basic accounting approach. So for basic earnings per share, we start with net income and deduct preference dividends. And that is your income attributable to ordinary shares. Then we divide it by the number of outstanding ordinary shares. And that is your basic earnings per share. Now, actually... Uh, when discussing this in higher accounting or in intermediate accounting, what we actually use in basic earnings per share computation is the weighted average number of outstanding ordinary shares. But for basic accounting approach, we simply divide it to the number of outstanding ordinary shares. Basically, when there is no change in the number of outstanding ordinary shares, then that would also be the weighted, av the weighted average number of outstanding ordinary shares. So there will be no problem with that. Okay, 
And then we also have share capital retirement. So when we say share capital retirement, in, in its simplest sense, we just say goodbye to the shares, okay? And since we say goodbye to the shares, we will debit it because it has a credit balance. We will debit it so that it becomes zero. So debit the share capital that you will retire at par and debit also the share premium attributable to it. So we will assume that the total amount of share premium at the time of retirement is the share premium attributable to all of the shares that are issued in outstanding. So you will prorate the share premium based on the number of shares that were retired. Okay, and then we credit it to cash. Why are we crediting it to cash? Because there will be a retirement price. So when you do this entry, when there is a debit deficiency, you debit that deficiency to retain the earnings. And then if there's a credit deficiency, we have a new paid in capital account, which is paid in capital from share capital retirement. Okay, then we'll be also talking about uh, treasure, treasury shares through reacquisition and reissuance. So upon reacquisition, our entry will be debit treasury shares at the cost of treasury shares or the number of shares that were reacquired by the corporation multiplied by the reacquisition price. Then credit cash for that same amount. However, the cost or the amount measurement of treasury shares would be needing some appropriation of retained earnings. So we will be debiting retained earnings and credit retained earnings appropriated for treasury shares. The time the, uh, there will be a reissuance of that treasury shares, your entry will be debit cash at the reissuance price, credit treasury shares at its original cost or original measurement, and any credit deficiency will be credited to pay the in capital from sale of treasury shares. And since the status of treasury shares has been erased by this entry, so you will also be reinstating the amount of retained earnings back to it. So you debit retained earnings appropriated for treasury shares going back to unappropriated retained earnings. We can also convert preference shares going to ordinary shares. So your entry will be debit preference share capital. That is the number of preference shares that you will convert from PS to OS multiplied by the par value. And then the premium attributable to those preference shares. And then credit ordinary share capital based on the number of equivalent ordinary shares that were converted coming from preference shares. So the same ruling, if we have a debit deficiency from this entry, then it will be debited to retained earnings. And if we have a credit deficiency, then it will be credited to paid in capital from conversion of preference shares to ordinary shares. We also have stock split. We have the split up and the split down. So these are just examples, but stock splits can be um, interpreted or can be expressed in lots of numbers. So let's say, for example, the stock split is two for one stock split. So two for one, you will be multiplying the number of shares by two over one and then the par value by one over two. So it will increase the number of shares issued in outstanding and it would decrease the par value of the share capital. However, when it is split down or one for two, for example, the number of shares will be multiplied by one over two and the par value will, will be multiplied by two over one. So it will decrease the number of the issued and outstanding shares and then it will increase the value Sorry, it will increase the par value of the share. So that's what happens in stock splits. And then we also have some other transactions. We can convert the par value to the stated value. So debit the share capital at par value and then credit the share capital at stated value. Or we can reduce uh, par value. So debit the share capital at its old par value, credit the share capital at its new par value, and then any deficiency will be credited to paid in capital from reduction of par value. Okay, and always remember the equation that issued shares is equal to outstanding shares plus treasury shares. Always remember that when shares are already issued, it stays as issued. Okay, now uh, our greater concern is that if its status is if that issued share is still outstanding or if that issued share is still is or it becomes a 
Treasury share. Okay, so that's it. That's our quick notes for corporation accounting. Please like and subscribe. Search Uwa's Accounting Lessons PH. Thank you very much and have a great day.